Hey guys, welcome again to another episode of the Semi Soccer Expert Podcast, also known as the C, C. Podcast. We're on episode number. Adrian, I know you just told me. I'm sorry, but I'm blanking my mind right now. We're number 46. 46 episodes down. 46 episodes down. Four more to uh, we get to number 50. Really excited. Uh, four plus six is 10 because there's nothing special about 46 that I can think of. But four plus six is 10. Number 10, Maradona, Pelé, Messi, Schneider. Uh, great number 10s right now that I can't think of. Also. Ozil, number 10 for Arsenal. Mm-hmm. Uh, Riquelme, number for, 10. Was for Arsenal. Arsenal. He just recently transferred to Fenerbahce. Fenerbahce, and he's wearing number... F- I think it's 46. Yeah. No, I don't think... Is it 46? No, it's like 67 or something. Yeah, I was like... You almost got me there. <laughs> um, but yeah, there's been... A, I'm pretty sure the number 10 is obviously um, a lot of play, favorite players, and it's also like the, the player who... Runs the show, as you can say. Um, not just Ozil, but in this day, you know, you have Bruno Fernandes who plays in a number 10 role. Um, a lot of players have adapted as well, and they've made it their own. And it's pretty much been some nominous for the like, in the football world the last 20 years, I might say, because I think the number 10 role is taking um, a role in its own and that you have to be like a special kind of player to make to make doing that position because you know you're obviously not just deep in the midfield but you're also like dictating play and everything else that goes with that yep spot on number 10 uh number 10 is usually give it to the best player like you said it's the guy who's dictating in the play who runs the show and you know with whatever magic he has at his feet he controls the crowd um it's very it's not so much the tactical thing but it's also very symbolic of what the number 10 is embodies especially in the argentinian south american culture uh, he's the person with the most gambetta you know the player who can uh dizzle dazzle through any defense through any players just with his feet uh, put on a show so yeah again number 10 very special uh but i really want to get this out of the way because i am south american the copa libertadores was this past uh saturday and uh palmeiros palmeiras beat santos of of Pelé, 1-0 in the final. Very interesting thing. Uh, Palmeiros and Santos, they're from uh, the Sao Paulo region, or I think, I want to say that Santos is part of the Sao Paulo region. Is in the, is, they're both Santos and Sao Paulo are two different cities, but Santos resides within the Sao Paulo region, and they played the final of the Maracanã Stadium in the Rio region. So I think for all the Rio clubs, they were really upset because, you know, obviously the rivalry there is, between those two regions, because you have the uh, the state championship, you know, in Brazil, you have the main, the, the national championship, but they also play state championships. They have the Re, the Rio uh, state championship and the uh, Sao Paulo state championship. And those are very heated, heated tournaments because, you know, both those regions produce phenomenal clubs in Brazil. But, you know, just really quick, uh, Palmeiras beat uh, Santos 1-0. To be honest, it's quite a boring game. I, I, did, I didn't enjoy it enjoy it to pass the to pass the finals you know when you compare that uh one final between Boca and River in uh in Madrid you know sold out crowd in, in Spain and and that was an amazing final uh but not to get too ahead of myself and as you know the Copa Libertadores is now being played in one one uh one game and prior years it was two games I think this is the second year they did do the one game and now what they're doing is that Colin Ball is taking applications from different host cities to see who's going to host the next uh, final. And uh, I feel, to be honest, those, those finals are going to be rotated between Brazil and Argentina because they have the better stadiums, the stadiums with the most capacity. Uh, I don't see it being held anywhere else, to be honest. But, uh, you know, again, just I wanted to point that out. And since we're talking about Copa Libertadores, uh, there were no fans in the stadium. Well, but actually, there were very little fans. There were some fans, uh, but very, very little. Fans. I would say that's the most recent probably event in soccer that actually has fans. Given how Europe is no fans at all, maybe over in Asia, like potentially in the Chinese league, if it's, if it's still running. Oh, well, the, well, the EPL had fans recently up until the second outbreak. Um, Italy had some fans as well. J- the Holland has fans. I saw, I saw in uh, the Everdees, 
championship. They were having fans. And it's very interesting because in the ever in the Dutch, the Dutch championship, they'll actually it, it looks well organized. You actually have a person here and then three seat, three seats after another person. And meanwhile, I was I think I want to say it was a Liverpool game. They had everybody in one stand. You know, you have a 40 40,000 seater stadium, you should spread everybody out, except they had one the whole everybody in the whole one stand. It doesn't make sense. You know, yeah, they're all clustered together. They were all clustered. Absolutely, hundred percent. They were all clustered. It's very hard to, uh, to, to, to you know, to dictate someone to hey wear a mask. A lot of them didn't have masks. Um, hockey has fans. Hockey has fans right now. Uh, the USL had fans. A lot. A lot of sports teams have fans. Yeah, it's like there's several teams like right now. Even in the NFL playoffs, they have fans. Um, for the Green Bay Packers, there was fans. Um, I believe in, T- in Tampa there were fans. Likewise, in um, on the Buffalo Bills when they were playing in the playoffs, they actually had their fans. So yeah, it's been a little bit sporadic here and there. But I think recently it it is interesting to start seeing a couple more fans back in the fold. Even though you know we're still in the middle of this pandemic, you know, um, we sure we're getting vaccines and all, but um, you know, unfortunately we're still not we're not there in the clear yet. So as much as we do want fans, still little by little. Hopefully by summertime we do expect fans to get back. Hopefully between twenty-five to fifty percent capacity, I would assume, because ideally, you know, this is a virus that still needs to be contained and still needs to be taken serious. No, absolutely, hundred percent. Um, but you know, let's let's talk about the missing fans and the major league that we like to talk about. That still, I don't think had a lot of fans was uh, the MLS. I think the last. The final with Columbus Crew and Seattle did have some fans. There were some fans at that final. Uh, but, you know, MLS, what, what is the big thing going on with MLS today? And probably the most important for our podcast in general. Yes. Yeah, so uh, what's been going down, and this is like legit since um, this is 24 hours from now after we air this, um, we can potentially be under a strike with um, MLS and the Players Association. So both sides have not reached an agreement yet. Um, it was actually, there was actually a deadline set for last week, um, but that it got extended for another week. And now um, they have a hard deadline set for the fourth on Thursday, potentially I think midnight, that's when a lot of deadlines go through. Um, it looks like both sides are still far apart from a deal, but we're getting reports as we speak on Twitter uh, from journalists stating that they they are close to um to a potential deal, but there's also talks from um, journalists as well from the player side that they're saying there may be a lockdown and to anticipate one because um it's um it looks like both sides are not going to reach an agreement and it's it's a pretty crappy situation to be in, especially from the player side because you know if you do want their season is actually going to pick up soon. MLS season usually picks up in March, but they pushed it back to April, and now they expect the players to return or to start, you know, doing like um, training and getting drills in, and to show up with your team come February 22nd. So now with this whole threat of a lockdown being imminent, it's going to be interesting to see how it goes within the next 24 to 48 hours. <clears throat> So where, where do we start here? Yeah, it's, it's just like there's so many layers to pick this out. Um, so pretty much the reason why both sides are apart from each other, uh, one of the major things is that the MLS wants to extend a year into their current CBA deal to 2017. So by doing that, the um, MLS wants to make – it's pretty much th- them dictating a move for them not to um, extend or renegotiate a deal um, during the World Cup, because you know when the World Cup happens, it's going to be here in the United States. Um, there's going to be a lot of economic growth, a lot of revenue p- potential for MLS that um, the player association player association can benefit from. And MLS is like, now nah, let's have a fixed rate up until after the World Cup, and then we'll talk then. So um, the player association obviously wanted to end the current deal. MLS is not going for it. So this is where the rift is starting to take take place between both sides and yep. yeah all right so with that also the second thing is also um both teams are still trying to figure out um the the revenue also with um some 
a word that we actually came up with, or we found out was economic um, concessions. So we're trying to figure out um, specifically what does that entail of? We're going to do a little more digging because this, this is obviously going to be a, another part in the next episode just to find out where the money is going as well. Um, but yeah, this is pretty much a shitty situation. Like I said, um, the player association is being hardballed. Um, but on the bright side, they, you know, there's other um, federations, um, other organizations, sports organizations, player association, NFL, NBA, um, MLB that is offering support from the for the MLS player association and as well from the fans as well. Um, the third rail that supports NYCFC has actually set up, well, not just them, but all fans from all different teams have set up a hashtag, let them play 2021. Yeah, yeah, a lot, it's a lot of stuff to, to unpack. You know, I think the, one of the things I want to kind of point out is, you know, they had already renegotiated the CBA, uh, not, not renegotiated, but uh, a change in the CBA when the COVID first hit and the players already took a reduced salary. Yeah. Well, so my, my thing is, I understand from a business perspective why MLS wants to renegotiate their, their, their contract with the players. But, you know, how, how much money is MLS as an organization taking versus how much these, these players are taking? Um, I know MLS laid off a lot of staff. You know, I think anyone who works in the world of soccer, especially in the United States, understand that MLS laid off a lot of staff. Now, obviously, they really can't lay off the players, but it just kind of baffles me. It's like, how much more money are you really taking away from the players and from the working people and how much the MLS top executives are pocketing? You know, it, it seems like a case of, of the rich getting richer and the poor getting poorer. And, you know, I, I understand about like, you know, playing your franchise, you can't be paying your, your franchise player like a ton of money uh, at the end of the day, but let's be honest, is Carlos Vela going to get his contract renegotiated? No, it's probably going to be the young 21 year old kid who got drafted in college who's only making the minimum of 53,000 or whatever the minimum is right now. He's the one who's going to get hurt. You know, yep. it's the guys who, who are on the bench who, who, who barely making ends meet and, and the ones that are going to be suffering. You know, I remember back in the day, the starting goalkeeper for the Rapids had to do the summer camps because he needed the extra money for him and his family, you know? And I think we're, we moved past that point, but still it, it's the little guys who are going to get cut. And I, I love, I love seeing this, this support from uh, the across other sports, you know, from the MLB, the NBA, the NFL, we saw all the other major sports. I'm sure the NHL probably sent the statement as well you know, supporting the players and this hashtag let the players play. That's a great movement. I love it. And it's just, it warms my heart, man. It warms <laughs> my heart because we got to give more support to the players. I, and again, I hate, I hate this organization a lot because just to, to, not to sound redundant, but it's the rich getting richer, you know, at the end of the day, it's the players doing the work without the players. We have no sport. We have no league. And it's crazy because they're it's like they're built like a almost like a socialist empire, but Absolutely. it's really not everyone's benefiting. It's more capitalistic based. Um, I'm saying um, socialist in this in the fact that with the um, salary cap and all, but at the same time, they're it's like they're um, contradicting themselves because at the same time, a lot of players like like you mentioned the the French players, not just the French players, but the players in the lower end, the told told them. They're the ones who are going to suffer the most out of this because not only they're losing money, but you know the salaries being frozen. Um, they're they're going to lose money. This this potentially not going to. The players are not going to get a raise. Like those type of players are not going to get a raise up until like the 26, 2026 season, and that's really sucks for them because you're pretty much playing for the same amount of money in the contract, and if you're lucky, you may get a sponsorship deal here and there. But that's if you're lucky and your name is that marketable. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think I think another interesting point is that, you know, while we were digging for more information, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I saw that the media rights right now are at 25 percent yeah, for, for the players. And then the MLS wants to cut it down to 12.5. So that's just killing them even more. That's absolutely. And I, I think I think the revenue split in the NBA is 50 50. Yeah. 
Now, obviously, we all know that the NBA generates a lot more than the MLS. But still, when you're the one, as a player, I'm the one who produces the product for there to be media rights. MLS is taking more than a quarter? They want more than... (laughs) they want. So from taking 75%, they're now gaining pretty much 87.5% control of that um, revenue share, which is ludicrous because... Like, why do they need extra, that much extra money? Granted, oh, we're losing money. You know, even um, the head honcho, um, I forget his name. Uh, Garber. Garber, yeah, Garber, saying, oh, we're going to lose out on a billion dollars this year and such. I'm like, okay, it sucks, but at the same time, we're in a recession um, right now, and nobody intended this for happen. You know, this is where, you know, obviously sacrifices are going to have to be made, but at the same time, you're losing like a million dollars and you're making like triple or quadruple that, then you, is it really that much of a sacrifice from you? You know, but then again, I don't know what these, you know, these, these financial investors spend, whatever the case may be, but I feel like they're the ones who put in the pressure on and they're the ones who don't want to lose the money because they don't want to just see a, you know, a, a drop or a decline in their revenue growth. No, I, I, you know, it kind of baffles me that a billion dollars is, is being lost you know, I think you agree with me that back in school, we were learning about how the majority of revenue was more ad based from the ads, from the TV rights. You know, if you think about everything, the only thing that's really missing is the experience inside the stadium. Mm -hmm. You know, we had MLS had a summer tournament and then it had, it had what was considered a regular season crammed in from, from July to, to December. But, you know, I, I kind of wonder how much is the gate receipts and the actual food concessions and the, the money has generated the station at, at the stadium, how much of that money is actually part of the whole revenue? Because again, going back to what we learned is that majority of the money is made from the TV rights and from all the ads and the sponsorships. Now, why... Up until, you know, play didn't really resume until June. Yeah. June, July, I think it was June that play resumed. They couldn't have lost that much more money. I, I, I would have never said a billion dollars because you still had people still watch TV. Like, I think, I think this year we had the strongest viewing for MLS because people had to watch it on TV. There was no other choice. You know, obviously, MLS views were still never high, high to begin with, but I, I, I don't think the views went down. Yeah, so and, and went- the amount of content that was, like, produced slash streamed, air, all of the above, I'm pretty sure they still got their fair share of ads right. that, was, that was met, and I think they're just using the pandemic as an excuse to be like, I, hey. I think, yeah, I, I want to say that that number is a little, little misleading because – yeah, it's definitely fudge because at the end of the day, the only thing that was lost was the, the game day revenue. Yeah. <clears throat> I think that's – but I think that's why the players – not the players union. I always, get, I always get confused. With the league – I'm going to separate. The league represents MLS and the players union players association represents themselves. Um, I think that's what they've been trying to do. They're just trying to maximize on everything that they lost on money and they're just trying to capitalize it. And, you know, they – they feel like, you know, I, they feel like the power is in their hands, mm-hmm. give and take, because now since the player association doesn't want to meet their demands, especially that extra one year extension, the MLS is playing hardball and they're saying like, hey, we'll do a lockdown. We won't do a season until you meet our demands. And I'm pretty much, it's pretty much putting them in a the corner because they're like, hey, we just want to play, you know, granted, we're already taking these losses and you just, you know, you, you just you know, beating them down like, like no other. And it's, it is unfair. And I think MLS just needs to just suck it up and just like, Hey, you know, granted you didn't finalize on a, on a CBA deal, but at the same time, you know, you still need your players. You need them right now. And you feel like it can go a long way. But like I said, when greed is in the way, it's not really going well. You know, this whole, this whole talk of strike players union versus the league Another another beautiful case of why uh, football, soccer in America shouldn't be a single entity. As we all know, Major League Soccer is one business, not 20 different businesses. 
It's not like the Premier League where you have one league and 20 different teams. You know, the only thing that needs to be negotiated between the teams is the TV rights deal. That's the only thing they negotiate. Obviously, and I think it, when it comes to this situation, these type of conditions, I think teams overseas have done a lot better than the MLS. You know, I, I don't think many teams overseas didn't have to do a player's cut, a uh, salary cut for anybody. You know, very, very few teams uh, did something like that. But I think it's a beautiful case of why we don't need the single entity anymore, why every team needs to be one individual business instead of one giant business. Um, and, my, and my last point here is like just to restate how it's very nice to see all the other sports supporting the MLS, uh, the MLS Players Union, um, because they know. I think I think it's also a very specific move. I, I don't just think it's a, a hey, let's help our, our uh, fellow union guys. But, you know, if we don't support them, this could very well happen to us. Yeah. You know, and I, the support has been outpouring. Like, I just took a quick peek at Twitter. Um, a lot of supporter groups are supporting them. Pretty much everyone, not just within MLS, actually, um, NWSL is supporting. I believe you got some USL teams as well. So, you know, it just shows a solidarity amongst everyone. And it's good to see the support because, you know, this does affect lots of lives. And, like, you know, just to tie it all together, you know, it also ties the players who are not making, you know, the, you know, the millions of dollars or even the top, you know, salary projections so you know you have you have to look out for the little guys as well right right 100 percent um i want to talk about something uh that it just recently happened i didn't know i didn't mention to you but since we're on mls did you see the new philadelphia union jersey i heard about it yeah they changed it recently beautiful so for anyone who haven't seen it that's uh it's a very it's a sky blue with kind of thunderbolt looking uh jersey um, little Thunderbolt designs. They're going with this uh, theme of electricity. And to be honest, at first I was like, it's very, very different from Philadelphia Union because I, I don't, I couldn't figure out the association with the electricity. But uh, then I remember Benjamin Franklin invented electricity. So <laughs> you remember the whole story with the key and the kite? Yeah. yeah, yeah. And so then it made sense. I was like, wow, that, for, that was a beautiful connection to Philadelphia's history and past. And to the jersey. Now, on to the more serious point, the very important point about this jersey, it was a collaboration with the fans. You know, this was a whole, this concept jersey was 100% made by the fans. You know, I think that's, that that concept had, had won me over, not just that they collaborated with the fans, but they produced a beautiful product. You know, when unfortunately, and no disrespect to anyone who does this, but the graphic designs, the, the, whoever does jerseys and visuals and all that stuff, I feel like because they work for these entities, for MLS, for Red Bull, for Philadelphia Union, for NYCFC, they have to kind of follow this corporate structure of designing something that the, these, in, these people, these groups want. But Philly said, no, let's see what the fans want. And I think this morning, like Twitter took off with it. And there's just been so much love, support for this new jersey. I want to get a jersey myself. It's a dope jersey. You you gotta check it out. The new Philadelphia jersey. It's like a sky blue with the with the, the the yellow details. And what I love about it most, it doesn't follow the simple Adidas templates. You know, you know how the mostly Nike and Adidas have a template jerseys, and then the whatever team just puts their colors on it. I think this, it's still a little bit of a template, but it strays more away from it. I think Adidas collaborated also with that. And I think it's a huge marketing point for Adidas in general. So, but uh, Philadelphia Union, I love your jersey. If I get it, if I can get my hands on it, I will. Yeah. Yeah. We're going to actually yeah. retweet this as we speak. Um, it's a really dope jersey. It's very, okay, it's unique to say the least and not in a bad way. Um, it's different. It's portraying, like you said, the lightning strikes on the sides of the shirt. It looks very <clears throat> unique in, in its own. I, and, I you, know, like you, don't, you don't like it. Huh? You don't like it. Tell me the truth. That's okay. I give it a six. 
six. I mean, it, it's not it's not my color scheme. Like I I like the the dark. honestly, it looks way better than the old jerseys. Those old, old jerseys look trash. So I like the, the, I like the old jerseys. I like the the close to generic. The so navy nice. blue. The, the design is generic, but I like the navy blue and the gold. The 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 darker goldish color. Yeah. I like I like that color scheme. I don't like this color scheme, but as a design, I like this color scheme a lot better. As a design and as a unique unique jersey, I think it's great. Yeah, like I say, it, it looks great. And we did actually mention different crests and everything else in our last episode, last two episodes. Um, you should definitely check those out, especially with Houston the Dynamo's recent transformation, and also um. Um, Montreal Club de Montreal or Club Football de Montreal or something. Uh, I forget. I already butchered the name, but more along those terms. Um, we did mention and praise those teams of their recent change. But yeah, definitely a shout out to Philly Union for go- for trusting the fans as well. And you know, it looks like it was done in in cohesion with the supporters, um, supporters union. So with that being said, shout out to them for listening to fans, and hopefully. You know, we actually see more different unique jerseys taken off just like this in the near future because it is cool. You know, not just for a soccer jersey, just to look different, but it's just to look like it represents the fans more than anything because they're the ones who represent not just the players wearing the jersey, but also the fans who wear this on a daily basis. They're the ones who pay, who pay for the jerseys as well. So it goes hand in hand. Uh, I, I want to say, if I'm not mistaken, the pre orders started today. I'm just gonna check real quick. Yeah, they're they're marking the shout out of this jersey, and I would too. You know, I'm I'm gonna say that all these jerseys are out of uh, stock right now. Let me see if I could get. Oh no, I got it. You got it in Philly. <laughs> Let me stop. Yeah, I gotta I gotta sign uh, I gotta sign up for the pre order. I think I might get it. I, I'm really I'm very close to getting it. <laughs> but, uh, Adrian, before we wrap things up, are we missing any other topics we gotta talk about? Um, so yeah, before I go off on another tangent, um, our last topic for the day is actually um, about FC Dallas. So um, not just about FC Dallas, but um, the uh, amount of uh, players they're able to produce and that are, have gone to Europe. So recently, um, FC Dallas, in the past four to five years, they've sent over, I believe, a good amount of like seven to ten players who have played in Europe and some of them have actually made a name for themselves. Um, you have um, Shaquille Moore uh, who's been uh, playing who played for right back for the U.S. men's national team is playing in Europe. I think he's playing the championship level. Um, you also have Reggie Cannon who's playing <clears throat> who's also another name from, for who's played for the U.S. national team and the biggest name out of that is Weston McKenney and McKenney is actually one of the biggest names out now for U.S. soccer, um, you know, he's been playing with Juventus and, uh, you know, he's been lighting it up on fire. He's been starting for them, been pretty much an irreplaceable player for them. And it's been getting a lot of praise, which is good because he's initially on, on loan from Schalke and he's playing for like one of the biggest teams in all of Europe. Mm-hmm. Don't you think, Marco? I'm Mario. <laughs> mm, now you, you call me Marco. And you call me. <laughs> yeah, but yes, no, but, uh, you know, just tied everything. FC Dallas, even prior to this Bayern, um, Bayern Munich partnership, FC Dallas was, is a world-renowned academy. Yeah. You know, I think from this, the coaching circles, there was always positive things being talked about uh, FC Dallas. I think it also has a lot to do with being located where it's actually physically located. It's very close to, to Mexico. You have a huge population of Mexican Americans living down in Dallas, and you know Latinos. We love our we love our football. It, it gave I think it gave FC Dallas a higher players pool to pick to pick players from. You know, one that's one, and obviously you know they have w- world renowned coaches. You know they have very great professionals working there. You know so. It's very, it's very great to see how this partnership with Bayern is. Like you said, they sent some players out to train with the first team. I think prior to that, they were doing that for a while too. And then obviously, you know, the biggest example is Weston McKenney, who went to Schalke, which prior to Schalke's recent form is a big club. Like, let's not forget that Raul 
play for there. Uh, Hunter played there. Big names. It's one of the bigger teams in Germany. You know, he plays for Schalke. Now he's playing for Juventus. Ten time, I think they're going on nine straight uh, Serie A leagues. They might win it this year if, if Milan doesn't win it. Hopefully Milan doesn't win it. But regardless, you know, Weston McKinney playing at, at a big club. He scored a beautiful goal against Barcelona. He's going to be a regular for the national team. You know, FC Dallas has produced amazing players in the past. And I think by having this partnership with Bayern Munich, I'm very surprised that none, not other, a lot of other MLS teams don't really do that. You know, the only one... I think obviously- it's just the association with um, FC Dallas. Like you said, FC Dallas is one of the more popular academies out there. I would even say in the world because not just producing American talent, but, you know, um, I'm pretty sure ta- that area in Dallas has been producing a lot of, t- um, like, t- academy tournaments, um, especially from European teams. So it is it is a hotbed. And, and not just because, you know, in that area, the climate is very nice. You can play soccer there all year. But, you know, also it's just like it's been able to attract a lot of potential, um, you know, future stars and players who want to, you know, make a name for themselves. You know, and what's very interesting is that both FC Dallas and Houston don't have a great uh, attendance. Oh yeah, well that that too, <laughs> which is which is mind-boggling because obviously you have, you you know, the Mexican American population which which loves soccer. These 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 matches are very poorly attended. Um, but yeah, no, like you mentioned, a lot of European teams actually they'll take their academies and fly out to Dallas to play summer tournaments. Yeah. You know, and this is this has been happening for a long time. And it, it, again, it really surprises me that the Rebels have not done something similar. Obviously, the Rebels have the, 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 the partnership with Red Bull in general, but Leipzig and Salzburg are recent things. Yep. You know, New York Red Bull is much older than those two teams. Yep. You know, NYCFC, I'm sure, should do something like that. You the city football group, there's no way that, that they don't you know, do something. We're a city football group. Let's have a tournament in New York. You know, Randall's Island. I'm sure city football guru can rent Randall's Island for a day. Yeah, they definitely can. Red Bull can rent Randall's Island for a day. And for those of you who don't know Randall's Island, is, it's an island that is sits between Queens and um, and Manhattan and has virtually, what, at least 10, 20 different football pitches, 20 different baseball pitches, you know, they play lacrosse, they play American football. It, it, that is, you can have a tournament there. You can have a legit, legitimate, very good organized tournament, and it overlooks the Manhattan skyline. So I don't know why <laughs> why the two major professional teams we have here has not done something similar. Well, if they do it, they can say they stole it from you. <laughs> they will. They will. I want, I want my revenue share from this. <laughs> you watch. Yeah, you just hope it's not 12.5%. <laughs> I hope it's not 12.5% for sure. But on a closing note with that, it's just crazy because, like we talked about, like there's so many players, not just from FC Dallas, but also all over the pool from uh, MLS as well. Like we mentioned, Red Bulls, you got your Tyler Adams breaking out as well there. Um, Gio Reyna's bl- breaking out. You could say he's an NYCFC Academy kid. Um, Alfonso Davies. And, you know, there's like, I gotta hate to be like, I hate to sound like a, um, I'd say re- really redundant, but like, you know, we've had, we've been having a lot of MLS players, um, Academy players who are transitioning over to Europe. So is this also a, I know it's a good thing from, you know, the players to gain experience advantage and everything going to Europe, but you think that also hurts MLS as well from an academy, not academy, but like as a league standpoint, because, you know, all these players rather just go to Europe, get the fundamentals, develop their skills, sharpen it and become world class players, which they eventually will be. Because I feel like in the next five years, um, a lot of the USA players are going to like be in Europe for a majority of the years instead of MLS. I don't. I don't think it's going to hurt MLS's um, overall growth. I think they they've come to the realization though that MLS will never be the same product that there is in Europe. You know that, that's it's never going to happen. You know, Europe has been doing this since since the forties. You know, majority of Europe has been playing professionally since the forties. 
MLS, there was a point where MLS said we can be as good, if not better than Europe. And that's a, that's a totally ridiculous statement. You know, unless there's a huge economic downfall in Europe, I think that's the only way where we'll see if I'm and assuming that the United States stays economically viable. That's the only way where I see that MLS will be better. Now, that obviously, and then we go back to my favorite topic of promotion relegation. We go to my favorite topic of the single entity. You know, once those things are addressed and are more modeled after Europe, yes, it will be, I think, I think maybe MLS, you know. Remember, Don Garbo is a football guy. Don Garbo is an NFL guy. He is not a soccer person. He came from the world of the NFL. You know, that's why our CBA, our structure is more modeled after the NFL. And the Premier League is trying to do that. Premier League is moving into that, that direction, but that's a whole other topic. But anyway, you know, and, and then there's that point, And there's also the point that ML, soccer is still not the most popular sport among children. It's still not a cultural thing in America. You know, it's not like when you're in Europe and you go in America and, and in South America, you walk out your door, you take your ball to the playground, and you can play. You know, that doesn't happen here. At least not when I was growing up, it didn't happen like it happened back home. You know, in, in New York City, it happens because this generation of kids is growing, is doing that. My generation, when I was growing up, it was the cusp of that we were just starting to be able to take our bikes to the park and we could go play but prior to that no so this is this the culture of soccer is about maybe 10 15 years young mm -hmm. you know yeah and i also mentioned because you know it's an interesting um conversation to have because like you we do want to see our players grow and become like you know the next big things because a lot of these american players have been turning it up there they're showing their potential and it's been good. But however, like I said, it does it hurt MLS here or there? You know, there's different ways you can talk about it. But yeah, I think for now it is best for them to develop there because they're not going to get any better. Even Jordan Morris um, went over to the championship right now. He's in Swansea. Swansea yeah, he just signed to Swansea. Yeah. And, and actually not just him, uh, Paul Ariola signed as well, I think, no, over to Swansea. He, he went a loan deal to Swansea as well? Yeah. So now we got a lot more Yanks over there, which is good. Like I said, these players, um, Morris, he was bound to go to Europe earlier, but he's one of those rare players that actually stuck in MLS. And actually, you know, he's hit some patches, but he, you know, we, I think I know the type of player he is. Um, since I seen him start playing back in college, you know, he's always been like one of those players that gives it his all. He'll play any position forward. And he's been solid. So it's interesting to see him playing in Europe and see how far he takes it as well. If I'm not if I'm not mistaken, um, he Jordan Morris was one of the players who called who was called up to the national team while still playing at Stanford. Yeah, he was still in college. Or um, what's his name? The the, the German uh, man. I'm blanking out his name. I feel so ashamed. The German that was the head of the men's national Jurgen Klinsmann. Oh, Klinsmann. Yeah, he called him up. Klinsmann. He called him up, and then at the same time, there was a player from Minnesota, and I forgot his name. Uh, I think it was Christian Ramirez. He was playing for Minnesota. He all, he was playing in the NS, NASL and what was the second division in the United States, also got called up to the national team. Um, and, and to tie all these things back together, that comes from the fact that MLS thinks it's the top dog. Remember, in Jurgen, in Jurgen Klinsmann's era, he was pressured to call a majority of MLS players to the national team. And now you go to look at the national team. Who's who's being called up? They're gonna be called up from Europe. If you're not playing in Europe, you're not going to the national team. Yeah. You're not you're not going to the, the United States national team. And it, again, it just when you ask me the question if this is a good thing, it's a good for American soccer. But it's there's there's a lot of things. I think pros and cons in it. <laughs> pros and cons, and I think it has a lot of lot. It has a long way to go. And no disrespect to any of these kids that went over to Europe, but a lot of these kids, they had connections to go to Europe. 100%. Let's, let's, not, let's not forget, you know, the, 
how they got to where they got. Mm-hmm. You know, there's very few kids. I think Tyler Adams, to my knowledge, is one of the few kids that made it on, on based on his talent and being scouted through the Red Bull and climbing up the ranks. Um, but I, from what I've heard about other players is that somebody knew somebody and got them over there. Yep. You know, so it, it's very, it's again, it's pros so, and cons. It's who you know, too. It's who you know. But, you know, again, going back to this whole, does it hurt MLS? No, I don't think it hurts MLS. Anything MLS is starting to move into that direction where they recognize they're not going to be the best league in a very long time. But there, there's growth. I mean, if you talk about soccer in America in general, there is growth. There's more accessibility to kids, on, 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 even though that there still needs to be more. Let, let's not forget that a lot of kids fall through the cracks and they'll get seen, they'll get, get the opportunity to play professionally, they'll get the opportunity to play D1 when there's plenty of kids that deserve to play D1 on a full scholarship. But it is moving towards that direction and as a coach, there's more education resources. There's no more push to be a better coach. So in all, I think soccer in America is moving in the right direction. MLS is moving in the right direction, even though soccer in America is moving in a much better direction than MLS, if that makes sense. Yeah, and I think, it, like you said, bringing it all together comes in full circle. Um, you know, and hopefully we do hope. Um, we're, we're obviously going to stay intact with this um, – lockdown situation hopefully it does not end up being where the players are locked down and may have to delay their season or they may not even get paid etc so we're, we're going to see how this goes on and hopefully we're hoping for the best um we're going to put the hashtag let them play 2021 if you want to support your local mls team put that hashtag in if you want to see mls coming back to normal the more support the better it looks for them and more looks and more mls looks like an asshole so with that being said, I um, want to thank you guys for listening to me at episode 46. Uh, Mario, you got any last closing points? No, guy. Uh, just, uh, you know, thank you for listening. We're almost at episode 50. Bear with us. And again, like always, thank you guys for watching. Thank you guys for listening. <laughs>